And um, I just want to say welcome so much for being here today. I'm Lindsay Hager. I am the creator of this Enneagram Nine Stories, Stories community. Um, if you are not familiar with us, we're over on Instagram, also at Enneagram Nine Stories. Um, we have a new podcast called the Peacemakers Podcast. And today we're going to be um, diving in deeper to the chapter four of The Road Back to You, um, Suzanne Stabile's book and Ian Morgan Cron's book. So I'm just really glad that everyone's here. Um, in a little bit, I'll introduce myself further, but um, a few things before we start. So if you're live in the Facebook group right now, and if you're watching, um, we would love to know your comments and your insights on the book. So if you've read it in the past, or if you just have like a type nine um, question that comes up, put it in the comments and we'll be kind of pulling that into the group throughout this time and trying to answer some of those. And also, um, you may have heard that we're doing a giveaway. So at the end of this, we're going to do a giveaway for one of the books that we've talked about. Um, so stay tuned for that. Also, um, in a moment, we're going to hear just a brief introduction from each of our panelists that we here, have here today. I'm going to turn it over to Ida, and Ida is going to um, introduce herself and kind of take it into the panel portion. But thank you all for being here today. And Ida, whenever you want me to, to talk further about myself, I'll, I'll let you pass it back to me. But. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I've always got a bunch of questions because I love stories. I love hearing people's stories. I don't know if that is a nine thing or if that's just an Ida thing. But um, so excited to be here. I was uh, introduced to the Enneagram, Enneagram nine, uh, sorry, the Enneagram period assessment about a year ago. My background is in corporate America, specific to the financial industry. I do talent acquisition into the financial industry. I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching in terms of um, just transition. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do. And being in that talent acquisition space, there are lots of personality assessments out there that we use with candidates and so forth. So uh, another coach sort of gave me the assessment to do. We got the report and we were going to set up an appointment where they were going to take me through the results. Well, I read the report and wanted nothing to do with the Enneagram. <laughs> I did not like what I read about what I was um, typed as a nine. So anyway, I put it away for a year and only recently came back to it now that we all have quiet time and such and uh, picked up this book called The Road Back to You. So yes, it was an eye opener. Um, a lot of it made sense. I think I was just in a better place to do that kind of work with myself. And so I thought, wow, I wonder what other nines think of this. And this is how the idea came about. How about I get a room full of nines together and we talk about this book and what their takeaway was. Um, and uh, came across Lindsay's uh, Facebook group. We reached out to her. I, well, I just threw the ad out there. I said, any of the other nines want to come and join me for this conversation? Lindsay was one of them, told me she has her own group. And this is how the magic has happened, folks. So now we are here having this conversation. So I'm super, super, super excited. Um, I'm calling in from Louisville, Kentucky. I'm originally from South Africa, but I'm calling Louisville home now. Um, and so I would like to go around the room for everybody to take a minute or two, tell us your name, where are you calling in from, and um, why you are here today. So we have assigned a number order to everyone so everybody knew when to go, and I'm going to open it up, and I think, Helen, you get to go first. Hello, um, I'm Helen, and I'm calling in from um, England, from the UK, the um, southwest of the UK. Um, I'm here today because I've been following Lindsay for some months. I was actually thinking about it, Lindsay, and I suddenly remembered that I met you in the podcast group, making a podcast. Oh, that's right. That's right, and we got into a triangle of talking about our ideas for a podcast, and then I just followed Lindsay into hers, into the Enneagram, because I love the Enneagram. And um, so I'm here today because um, I'm in Lindsay's group and interacting every day. And I'm in the summer challenge 
that she's put on. So um, we've been going deeper in these last, uh, well, it's a month now. Um, so that's why I'm here. My name is Mandy. Um, I am calling in from the suburbs of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I recently, about two years ago, was introduced to the Enneagram uh, via the book. Um, and it's definitely been a very uh, hot and cold experience with <laughs> the good and the bad of learning your own type. But it's, it's been a good, uh, good ride so far. Excellent. Thank you, Mandy. Gwendolyn, I think you might be on mute, darling. Do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, Thank okay. you. Sorry. No, you're fine. I'm, I'm Gwen, and I'm calling in from Southwest Virginia. Um, my husband actually introduced me to the Enneagram about a year ago. And I, would get, I don't want to say I'm obsessed with it, but <laughs> I... <laughs> I pretty much love it. Um, this self journey is just fascinating to me. And as I've read more about it, it's like, oh, uh huh. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And so understanding myself better, my husband's a one. And so it's really helped us to understand one another better. And I love it. Um, I too just started a podcast <laughs> called mm -hmm. Redefining Bold. And it's about taking small steps towards lasting change. My website is called The Bold Abode. Um, and so it just kind of meshes that way that we all have our own way to define what our bold is. And for me, that's small, tiny steps. Love it. Love it. Thank you. All right. Hey, hi, I'm, my name is Mark Johnston. Um, I, my background is, has been in mental health and psychology for well over 12 years. More in recent years, I've um, become a relationship and marriage coach. And this is kind of where I picked up the Enneagram. I actually didn't like a lot of personality as assessments. I, I found them a bit horoscopy, like that kind of, they could fit just about anyone. And uh, my, my wife started looking into it a bit more and uh, introduced me into it. And I've started kind of saying, hey, this actually fits in a lot of things. And so I've been starting to incorporate it a little bit more into, uh, you know, <laughs> much like some of the others, I have my own podcast type stuff. So I've been incorporating into there and into some of my assessments when I'm working with my, my clients. So it's been, yeah, I, I like it a lot, especially because it, helps to explain strengths of certain personalities, weaknesses, how to help certain types, and how the different types interact together, which is probably not really helpful for a, someone who's dealing with couples. Absolutely. Where did you say you're calling in from? Mark? Oh, yes, I didn't mention that. I'm uh, in South Central Pennsylvania near Lancaster and Harrisburg. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. We're excited to talk to you today. All right, hey, I'm, I'm Terry Higgins. I am calling from Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I guess I've known about the Enneagram since early 2019. Uh, my wife is uh, actually now a professional coach. And so when she was starting going through her training, the Enneagram was something that she knew of, and it was a portion of her coaching. And so as a result, I got to be you know, put through the rigors of, you know, going through the process of trying to figure out who you were and all that kind of stuff. And what I really find that is fascinating about the Enneagram is that it's based on motivations, not behavior. Because if you were to ask me about Myers-Briggs, it's like, well, I'm an I in certain situations and I'm an E in other situations. But my motivation is the same and the behaviors come out to be different whether the behaviors can be different but the motivation is is the same and that's what i think is so strong about the enneagram it's a tool but it seems to be one of the more complete tools about you know who am i really why am i doing what i do well now terry, I don't do it terry don't do it so you know, but now with the enneagram started. We've got to get to introductions before we jump in, Terry. Cut it out. <laughs> I 
I know because I feel myself wanting to go, yes, intention. <laughs> so well, that's like, what I love about the Enneagram. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Terry. Hi, I'm Susie, and I'm calling in from the suburbs of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And um, my husband and I came upon the Enneagram about two years ago. Uh, we were both turning 40 and felt like we were hitting this time in our life where we needed some change and needed some, um, just some, some changes in our marriage too. And um, he had to point out to me what I was, which I hated because I did not want that. But I clearly can see why he had to do that because I think we probably all thought we were every other number. Um, and I can say it's changed my life for the better. Um, I reference it all the time. I use it with my relationship with my kids and my husband and my coworkers, and um, I love it. I think it's the best um, tool out there to help you make change in your life. Excellent, thank you, Susie. Hi, um, I'm Marjana. I also go by JJ. Um, I am in Central Valley, California, uh, near Fresno about the Enneagram about nine months ago now. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my coworkers just kind of mentioned to me, like, hey, take this assessment thing. <laughs> so I'm curious. And turned out she was a nine as well. Mm -hmm. um, so she was wondering, she was like, it's pretty similar to me in a lot of ways. <laughs> we uh, kind of connected on that and I took off and uh, personal life and also my professional life as well. It caused a lot of anxiety <laughs> towards the beginning, kind of finding out who I was and why I was that way in some ways. And uh, it's it's been really great though, ultimately. I love it. I love it. Hey, JJ. So I'm not sure what uh, where your mic is in relation to your audio, but it, whatever's bugging it, Sometimes oh. so I just wanted to make you aware of that, but we caught the gist of all of what you okay. were saying. Thank you. I'm going to switch over to my other headset here then. <laughs> all right, you go ahead and do that. Thank you. All right, I know that I assigned the next number. I just am not sure who I assigned it to. <laughs> you guys, you got to remember it your was me. I'm sorry. It's Nicole. <laughs> yes. Um, I am calling in from Spanish Fort, Alabama, on the coast of Alabama, and I originally was introduced to Enneagram through my graduate school classes. I was a classroom teacher and was just not finding personal satisfaction in that anymore and wanted to go back to school, and I've already been familiar with Myers-Briggs and a lot of the other occupational tests that we use. Um, so I got my master's in counseling, and now I'm a school counselor, and it's been very helpful with my freshmen, with myself, uh, with my sisters, it has been it's been great because I can see how different personalities work together and kind of predict the storms that are coming, not in my own life, but kind of help my students too. So I love it. I didn't like it at first. I did not want to be a nine. I wanted to be a two. But after months of trying to be a two, I just gave up and realized I'm a nine. So I love it now that I've appreciated it. I love it. Thanks for sharing, Nicole. Um, all right. I'm not sure who's next. I think it's me. I think I came right after Nicole. Um, hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Tribe. I'm calling in from Los Angeles, California, and I come from the background of child development. Um, I've been working with children for about seven years. Um, and like many on here, um, I came across the Enneagram about a year ago at the urging of one of my best friends who is a two. Um, and I, for most of that year, thought that I was also a two. I had typed as one. Um, you know, a lot of the, the attributes resonated with me, as did many types. But um, more and more and more, as I was kind of walking in that two identity, there were just a lot of things that weren't adding up for me. Um, so, you know, I, I took it again. But this time, I was really, really, really honest with my answers. And I came out as a nine. And um, I was not very happy with that result. I uh, 
initially thought nines were these kind of wishy-washy, boring, live in the gray, don't do anything kind of people. Um, and I've since abandoned that idea, but, and I, and I love being a nine now, but the Enneagram has been a life-changing tool for me. Um, I, I love the fact that I'm a nine and I've really enjoyed learning more about being a nine and, um, yeah, I'm really, really happy to be part of this panel today. Thank you, Elizabeth. Laura, I believe you're next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura and I am in like North Central West Virginia in a very, very rural town, um, a small college town here. Um, I have a marketing background and currently work as a, a talent recruiter for a staffing agency. And I found the Enneagram. Um, I think I took a test like when it was like a fad to take the Enneagram test and all the celebrities were tweeting what their number was. Um, and I got like a six and or maybe a two. I took it a couple of times, but I really didn't care about it much. Um, and about a year ago, I found myself in therapy, which I highly recommend therapy. Everybody should go to therapy, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, but I was talking to my therapist and she's like, have you ever, you know, heard of the Enneagram? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a six. I'm a two, whatever. She's like, okay, no, you're not. I'm pretty sure you're a nine. I'm not supposed to type you. That's your job. But I think you're a nine and I think you need to read this book. And she handed me The Road Back to You. And I um, actually ended up downloading it on audiobook and started listening. And thankfully nine is one of the early chapters because how they number it. And as soon as it started going through like the characteristics, I just started bawling. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not this crazy alien person. Like there are people out there that think and react the way that I do. And I have fallen so far down the rabbit hole. I have made all of my friends take quizzes and I have gifted the book to so many people and I am actually funny enough surrounded by sixes and twos which is what I had originally typed as so I'm really happy to be here and just want to learn so much about other nines and hi everyone <laughs> so wonderful oh my gosh so what what uh, Lindsay you are not off the hook my dear uh, I want you to tell us uh, where you oh, gosh. from and, and your relationship with this Instagram thing. Okay, great. So I, um, I've known I'm a nine, I guess, for the past, um, let me put me on speaker view, for the past um, two years, three years maybe, um, but I've been on like a personal development journey for, I don't know, 20 years. It's like I'm constantly trying to figure out who I am. And so I have a counseling background. And so I've dug into that through counseling, but I've just been like, who am I? What can I bring to the world? But the Enneagram kind of put those pieces together for me. So, um, so that's kind of like learning I'm a peacemaker is like, okay, this makes sense now. Um, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and um, I'm just trying to put myself out into the world as much as possible. So the more I step out and push past push past my fear. I'm learning more about who I am and I'm finding, you know, who I've been made to be. So that's what I'm trying to do through the Enneagram Nine Stories community and through the podcast is just be an example of somebody putting themselves out there in whatever way that looks like. It doesn't have to be through a podcast, but just, you know, being brave, stepping out, saying what I feel, and I'm just growing a lot in the process. So, so that's why I'm doing this. This is wonderful. Um, I'm going to share again the intention behind this conversation and hopefully future conversations um, with regards to nines and my belief in terms of what I have come to learn through my spiritual journey and then bumping back into the Enneagram and finally being open enough to apply what I'm reading um, is that I feel like nines are called the peacekeepers for a reason. I think we possess qualities that allow us to step into spaces where few can go in terms of natural ability. I think we all know this already. I think we all know this because we are already in spaces where we're doing the job and we're just not owning it. Um, we've got Mark and Terry and Gwendolyn and they've got their podcasts out there, Lindsay, uh, already doing the work in terms of uh, <laughs> the peacekeeper. Uh, but I believe too that during this time, during the quarantining and the social unrest, uh, the times we're going through, I think now more than ever, it is time for us to step into our own power as minds. And I'm hoping that we all leave from this conversation, even just listening to it, knowing who we are, 
or just being reminded of, of um, really what we came here to do as nines, as peacekeepers, as our, our role. Um, I've got a friend who's a seven. He reintroduced me to the Enneagram, it's work that he does. And so we had a point where when he annoys me, because I still want to choke him, he's a seven. <laughs> I tell him, yes, seven. And then he'll say, okay, nine. <laughs> so we start calling because we understand who we are and we leave space for the other to do their sevening while I'm doing my nining. And I think what I'm hearing is how you guys have been applying this tool in your day to day is understanding that everybody needs their space so that they can tell us who they are. Right. Um, so anyway, so that's where we at. Uh, Lindsay, I've got a question for you. Do you want to go to a quick true or false deal or do we want to go to a quote that he said? Let's do a, let's do a quick, uh, a quick fire, um, true or false. I think that'll be good to warm okay. everyone up. So here's a true or false, nines. I'm going to throw a statement out there. You're literally not going to think about it. I do not want, it must be a spontaneous response, right? And you've got to be on the money with your, your mute button here because we want to we wanna snap through it. So remember your numbers. Helen, you get to go first. And um, just, yes, it's true. This is why. Or no, it's false for me. This is why. We good? Ready to go? Mm -hmm. All right. Nines tend to be far too willing to die to themselves. True or false? Helen, go. Um, I'm not sure what die to self means, but I think the answer is probably um, yes, in, because my understanding is, of it is that you'll put yourself to the bottom of your list and, and most of the time you actually don't get to the bottom of your list, so you remain there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mandy, is it Mandy? Yeah. Go. Yes, I say it's true because regularly I am finding myself to uh, forget what I need to do. Something as basic as eating. So yes, true. Good. Next. True. Very true. <laughs> I've all, I've, I have uh, three sisters. I was the youngest. And as I look back on my life, I can always see putting their needs first and uh, being kind of the peacekeeper in our family. So true. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'd also like to say it's true. We have five kids, my wife and I, and I'm always, you know, taking care of the kids, taking care of what my wife needs, taking care of what my business partners need without forgetting myself. Next. Yeah, I would say that that's true. Um, just when you are eating cake, I will take the ugliest piece of cake so that no one has to have that piece. I love that. Thanks, <laughs> Terry. Next. I would say it's true as well. Um, and I think I have children as well. And I think as a mother, we've been told that we should take be last. And um, I'm also an educator and I feel like we have been told to be last too. And so, yes, I am last. Thanks. Uh, definitely. Um, I think growing up, I was the youngest in a, my whole entire cousin generation and everybody and I was last in a lot of ways, and I continually put myself there mentally as well. So, <laughs> Nicole? yes, that's definitely that's definitely true for me. I will um, mute my own needs to take care of everybody else. I've had to teach myself self care. <laughs> true, um, all the way. I am. I was uh, the middle child growing up. So classic middle child syndrome over here. Um, I was always kind of looking to the left and right to see what my siblings were doing, what the overall family dynamic was like, and, you know, blending into that if I had to, so as to not, you know, make waves. And so even now as an adult, um, somebody said self-care, simple, simple little things like eating, changing my clothes, whatever. There's moments where I just, I forget to do it. So true all the way. Laura? Definitely, definitely true. Um, kind of in line with what everyone else is saying. And yeah, I, I guess it's kind of a nine comment. <laughs> but um, definitely putting myself last. Um, and I find myself doing it not just in, you know, 
my with my relationship with my husband or with my child or, or even like with my parents or my siblings but in my friendships as well making sure their needs were met making sure um even if I was the only one that showed up for them you know they had a party it was always me and just them I feel like and and sometimes that wasn't reciprocated but I feel again that I didn't take that personally and would still continue to be there for that person Lindsay you get to go Oh man, um, I I put myself on the back burner all the time, and I don't even you know it's just an automatic thing. Um, so it's kind of it makes me sad to think about this role that I've played of just like negating my importance or asserting myself and myself in relationships. So so definitely true for me. All right. Well, in closing, on that little quick exercise, I'm gonna share this so I, yes true okay uh, uh it's because and that's why it's on my list of true and false because <laughs> i wanted to double check with the other nines and so just listening to the feedback on that and the truthfulness of that thank you all so much for sharing because this is real good stuff um what you all mentioned spoke to something negative in terms of putting yourself at last like others come before me. So it sounds like a negative thing to do, right? So I want to put the, the flip side or the other side of the same stick and bring it into the same place where we flip, not really flip it, but just shift our perspective in that, like, that trait that we have as peacekeepers. And so if I put myself last or I take myself out of the equation, I, but by doing so, I also allow the resolution to happen faster. So because I remove myself from the situation or the conversation or the perspective to a degree, I can see more of it. I, it gives me a broader perspective. So there's no bias or vested interest that makes me want to fight to win, right? So by doing that, one is able to see the broader perspective. One can step into the zone where you hold space for the two differences to come together and let's talk it through, right? So, so the very trait that one might see as a negative thing nines do because they put themselves last or they shut down to themselves or they think they're not important or not worthy. I think the very same thing allows the nine peacekeeper to take a different perspective than somebody that's in the fight, that's got a dog in the fight. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Lindsay is going to read a passage out of the book for us. Then we're gonna take 30 seconds to reflect on what comes up for us, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, sound good? Okay, so one of the passages in the book that I wanted to reflect on, it says, <clears throat> because the nine can see through all the eyes of every number, um, nines are unclear about who they are and what they want. So they drop their healthy boundary, boundaries, they fuse with more assertive people, um, those that they're looking up to or they idealize. And we gain this kind of like sense of, uh, or, or we, we lack this sense of identity and purpose. And so what I'm wanting to know is, does that resonate for you? How does it sit for you to hear that um, many of us don't know ourselves, we don't know our identity because we have fused with others throughout our lives and we've elevated others above ourselves. So think about that for a second and then we're gonna jump into having some, some feedback from you guys. I'm gonna read it again just so you can have a different voice, but then sit with it and, and see what comes up for you and then we'll throw it open in the number order, okay? <clears throat> average nines oh this is question number three sorry I don't oh, sorry sorry okay okay all right right here number three because they can see through the eyes of every other number nines are unclear about who they are and what they want they drop their healthy boundaries to fuse with a more assertive partner whom they idealize and from whom they hope to glean a sense of identity and purpose. But after a while, they don't know where they end and the other person begins. And so let's just take a few seconds of silence. 
to contemplate that. I'm gonna jump in here first and, and offer my reflection. Mm -hmm. um, I have, you know, like I said, I've put myself on the back burner of my life for a long time. And so um, learning that I'm a nine has been very grieving for me knowing that and seeing that. And so in some of the roles that I've played, um, you know, I, I was a school counselor and a, some, of, some of the roles that I've played in that position, um, I, I would go from one person, like talking to a teacher, getting their input about a situation to going to the next person, getting their input about a situation, going and talking to my administration or to a student. It's like this role of talking to multiple people in a, in a matter, matter of an hour and trying to gather all those perspective. And then what I end up with, what I did end up with is what do I think about this? What, you know, where am I in this situation? What is my, like, I'm trying to be the, the great mediator in all of this. I'm trying to bring my counselor, you know, heart to this, but I get lost, I, I would get lost in those situations. And um, so because I haven't been as assertive in my life, um, I would just like, you know, if someone, if, especially if it was a strong-willed teacher and they gave their input, I would be like, oh yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, I, I need to think that way. And then I go talk to the next person and I'd kind of mediate and bring that new information in. And then if they brought something different, if they said like, oh, I don't really think that, like, why did that, why does that person say that? Then I'm like, oh yeah, you're right about that. It's like, I'm seeing this part of the story. I'm seeing their point of view. And then I'm seeing their point of view over here, but ultimately just calls this big conflict within myself. And for one, I feel a lot of anxiety because I don't know how to lead through that. I don't know how to assert my opinion into that. And then I'm trying to bring in all these multiple perspectives, um, you know, to, to be a good leader in that space. And so um, that has been a, a theme for me as a nine, just, I guess, just um, losing myself in the middle of all of the louder voices than me in the room. Thank you. Sorry, that was too long for me. That's <laughs> <laughs> not too long. Helen? What, what came up for you? Um, well, the realization that I, without, I didn't know the Enneagram until 11 years ago, but I grew up like that. And I remember um, always saying with my mother, I never knew when she, where she ended and I began. And I could watch myself in lots of different um, sort of relationships. I knew the people I admired and I kind of, well, now I know the word merged. I merged with them and I took all their best sort of qualities and identified with them. And then um, as life went on, I took on things like I'm a, I'm a performer. So of course I could use that in my art, you know, and then I became a teacher. And so that served me really, really well. that I could do what I called go empty um, in order that I could then um, into it what any student in or child in front of me needed. So that was me using it in a good way, but I still didn't know what was going on, you know. And then um, I met a lady who was teaching Alexander Technique and I went for that treatment. And the first part of it was um, talking and um, basically it was the Enneagram. And we thought that I was a four like she was. And, and we were really shocked when we found out I was a nine. And at another point we thought I was a two like somebody else. And it was, I realized that's so typical. I merge with whoever I'm with, you know, I take on the same colors as they do. And I can see that there, there's a pain spot in that for me because um, it, it's taken me a long time to know who I actually am and stop, you know, idolizing everybody else. Um, but at the same time, I've been able to use it for its best in all my work with other people, with teaching, with friendships, you know, with any kind of um, communication situations. It's, it's been a good tool to use. Thank you, Helen. Mandy, what's come up for you? I personally, that was my least favorite attribute about being a nine was the merging because again, then who am I? It just depended on the day or who I was with. And I felt that so deeply that it never gave me an answer for who I really was. Like I had to do the work to figure out what I actually thought. I had to actually stop, process what was coming in, 
you know, and figure out where I stood on an issue. And that took me an enormous, an ornament, mm -hmm, that word, too long. It took me too long to figure out for, you know, a 40 year old woman. Um, I went most of my life without a lot of healthy boundaries. I went a lot of my life letting that merging tendency, you know, my ex-husband, it, it, what he felt, I felt, you know, um, I didn't know the difference between his feelings and my feelings. And it really caused issues, obviously. So the, I don't like the idea of merging just because of what I have experienced it as. Now, I will say in my current marriage, it is a very different kind of merging. This is a sim simplified uh, streamlining, making life easier for everyone, not because I don't have a voice, but because he honors my voice and gives me opportunity to change my mind. And I choose not to on some things. So there is a healthy merging, I feel like, that really... It serves the family, the greater good. And I'm okay saying, I truly don't have an opinion here. Um, but this, this topic for me was the hardest to get over about being a nine. It really hit home. Well, thank you for sharing. Gwen? I agree with you, Mandy. <laughs> I think that um, I grew up, I have a wonderful, loving family. My dad was amazing. My mom is so kind and um, I think she was a nine. She always did for us. My dad is very strong and we have a very conservative background. And so I grew up in that and not questioning our beliefs or um, understanding really what was out there until I went to college. And then I believe in college I began to differentiate and see that there are uh, not just lots of opinion, other opinions out there, and they're not necessarily wrong. And so I think at that point, long before I found the Enneagram, I was able to begin to, at least in my own mind, understand that maybe my opinions were different than my dad's, um, but yet not able to express them. So um, especially, and then I met my husband, Morgan, who is a Presbyterian minister. And before he went to seminary, I swore I was not going to be a pastor's wife. I mean, like that was like a deal breaker for me. My sister married a pastor and I just saw kind of behind the scenes of that. And it was difficult. Um, and so when I met my husband, Morgan, he was not, he was in graduate school for classics. So there was no kind of seminary on the horizon at all. And uh, we got married and then don't you know, <laughs> don't you know, he feels called to seminary. And, um, you know, there was a moment where I thought I should say, I don't want to go. And I didn't. And I supported him through that. And, I, and I'm, I'm happy that I did that. Um, but there's a part of me that feels conflicted about that moment in time because I didn't own my voice. Um, but I've been a little, maybe a little bit passive aggressive at times about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm working on that. Um, and so I, I do, I agree. I have a wonderful husband who allows me to have the space to express my own opinions and encourages me to do so. So I'm, I'm really actually very, very blessed. Thank you, Gwen. Mark? Yeah, so I, I find that especially on smaller things or especially if someone is expressing displeasure, I do tend to merge opinions. Uh, I find it really difficult if my kids are saying, oh, I'm, I'm really upset about this. Uh, case in point, uh, you know, with all the, uh, uh, the pandemic stuff going on, my wife and I had to decide, okay, are we going to send our kids to this private school that costs a lot of money? We've been sending it, them to it when everything's up in there. And we, I knew it would crush her kids because they, they loved going to school there. And I had a really hard time saying, no, we're not going to send them. We're going to do some other options. But I, I have found, um, you know, that I, I've kind of recognized this in myself. And so in running a business, I've learned to surround myself with other people who can handle these sort of things. So I like, for instance, I know that I can't handle customer complaints. If someone's saying I'm, I'm upset, I'm going to be like, okay, I really want to just give them a refund. 
I want to give them, <laughs> I want to make them happy. And I'm really good at making the, the uh, you know, my clients happy. But, uh, you know, if there's any sort of displeasure, I have to put it off to my assistant or to my you know, business partner or somewhere else. And so I, I'm, I cope that way. I say, okay, if there's going to be, you know, some sort of battle of wills, I'm going to push it off somewhere else. And, but I can really be there to be understanding, to help comfort the, the client, to help push them in a good direction. I, I do have very decisive areas. It's just not when someone's expressing displeasure. Thank you, Mark. Terry? Yeah, so while I've been reflecting about this, you know, it was, it, I, I kind of go back to, to my high school days where, you know, I never really had like enemies and I never really, and I had a good core of friends and most people will be like, oh yeah, Terry, he's, you know, he's a nice guy. And so then I realized, oh, well, that's because I'm merging with everybody and so I'm giving them enough of what they need that they're, I'm not abrasive. And so then I thought about one of the bosses where um, was very, very opinionated, very strong willed. Um, you basically did it his way or you did it his way. There was no other, those were your two choices. And so I was warned this going in but wouldn't you know it, after a couple of weeks, I was his confidant almost. And after a year, I was his confidant. He'd be coming to me with like these things about work. And, you know, at the time, I just knew it as, oh, this is just what I do. I didn't think about it. I didn't know that it was like merging with that other person. And then when I was going through uh, some therapy, probably about mm, five, six years ago, the, um, the person who I was seeing was like, well, you know, you need to establish some boundaries. You need to put like a fence up. And this is where you end and where the other person begins. And it was like my mind was blown. I was like, well, in concept, that makes a really good idea, but I couldn't think of it like that was like brand new. How, why would you do that? And so, you know, now it's like, well, if someone's going to ask me my opinion, it's like, what do I really think? Is this me being me or is this me trying to tell you what I think you want for me to say? Um, and I have found that if I trust my body, that if I'm starting to put dig my heels, oh, that must be what my true opinion is. Even if I can't name it right at the time, if I feel resistance from it, it's like, okay, wow, that's, that's an interesting revelation now. I really do have an opinion on where do we go for dinner, right? Um, so, so those were some of the things that, that I had, you know, upon reflection. I love that. Love it. Wow. And I believe, Susie, are you? Yes. I think that this is all so interesting to listen to, and it makes me a little emotional because in each one of your stories, I, I feel it and I hear it, and it's, it's a little painful to admit some of these things. And um, I agree with a lot of you. I had to take a little, some notes because that's how my mind works. Um, I think for me, I do go along with a lot of what other people say because I think, um, who was it, Mandy said, I honestly don't care about some things. Like I like all kinds of food. So I don't care where we go to eat. But if you're asking me a deep question about, let's say my faith or something, I can give you a strong opinion on that. And I don't know if that's like an eight wing coming out. Um, I can also get a little bit feisty, you know, when I have like an actual strong opinion, which is rare, <laughs> um, but it does happen. Um, and then the whole merging thing, and it was really interesting, Mark, to hear you say you merge more with a negative emotion. I hadn't thought about that before. And I would say that's definitely true for me. Um, I just have a, and like the separating myself from people, I do not even know what that means. Like I, especially with my husband, um, it just, I don't know how to not feel what he's feeling. And so I've been working on that in, in counseling and therapy too, but some days I'm just like, 
wow, like I was in a really good mood and now why am I feeling like this? I just don't even understand. And so, you know, he and I have had to talk a lot through that and it's been hard a little bit for me to understand that's on me. You know, he's allowed to have his emotions. He's allowed to feel how he feels and he can't change that just because I don't want him to, or I might take on his emotions. So learning the boundaries piece, which was also new to me, like what is a boundary? What we are allowed to have those? Wow, that's exciting. Um, so I think just all of these things, they're just really, really interesting. And Lindsay, you were talking about work um, and work. I was in a meeting, I'm a special ed teacher, a speech therapist, and I was at an IEP meeting and there was a parent who felt one way and there was a teacher who felt the other way. And I found myself agreeing 100% with both of them as they talked back and forth. And on my ride home, I thought literally to myself, they must think I'm crazy. They probably think I'm just going along with what they say to be nice and to not sh rock the boat, but I honestly could see both perspectives. And about a month later, I learned that I was a nine and it all made sense. <laughs> so it, I do see value in understanding both sides and I don't think there always has to be a 100% agreement with either or. So I think that's a positive for us nines. Thank you, Susie. JJ? Um, so merging and forgetting myself was is very common for me. Um, I had very, very opinionated parents growing up, very conservative background. Um, and uh, things as simple as we would have like a weekly family meeting and they would bring something up that wasn't necessarily my opinion or I didn't really believe the way they did when I was in my teen years and I was like, I don't agree with that. I would burst out in tears a lot of the time because I didn't want to share my opinion and they would just get mad at me. Why are you being so emotional? You got to get over it. Just tell us what you think. And I couldn't. I I literally couldn't bring myself to say the things that I felt because I knew that they disagreed. And that still lately has been a huge thing for me and my parents. I think I, my dad's potentially most likely an eight. We were talking about things and, and my sister's an eight and my mom's a two. So I have a couple of really strong people <laughs> and a very like loving person. And so it's, it was hard for me to be myself because there were so many strong personalities and things as simple as this is the person that I want to date. I would become rebellious and just keep it under the rug and hide it and not show it to people because I knew that they wouldn't agree with me or they wouldn't approve. And it just brought me turmoil. Thank you, JJ. Okay. So, um, Every time I listen to the things you say, I'm like, oh, that's, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was going to say. So um, for me, it started with not knowing what I wanted to major in in college. I knew that I knew what I liked and what I didn't, but I struggled to figure out what I wanted to major in because I wanted to make my family proud and I wanted to do this and that. I changed my major nine times in undergrad um, and then ended up teaching a class for freshmen on how to decide what they want to be when they grow up and soft skills. So it's almost like all of my indecisiveness actually benefited my career. And for a long time, I beat myself up on, well, why can't you just figure out what you want to be when you grow up? Um, so I think for me, it's been changing my, there's something wrong with you because of this to use this as your superpower to help 14 year olds that don't know what they want to do. So that's been a positive, I think, but I don't even know what my favorite drink is and I'm 34. So that's fine. <laughs> That was really cool. That's funny because somebody said, know how you like to eat your eggs, dang it. You like them scrambled, broiled, whatever. Anyway, sorry, I'll stop it. <laughs> yeah. I usually like what the other person is eating because I don't want to rock the boat and make two different kinds of eggs. Um, so, so many thoughts, but one of the things I just heard resonated with me um, working in childcare. Um, and in a lot of workplaces, sometimes as a new coming employee, they give you this list of like 
your favorite things so they can, re, you know, file that away. And maybe when a birthday or Christmas comes around, you know, they know what to get you. And I remember feeling so much anxiety about these. What's your favorite candy? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite? Because while I'd have really strong opinions about some things, other categories, it's like, I don't, I don't really know. And I write something down. And even after that, I'm second guessing it. I don't know. Is that really my favorite? I don't know. Um, but on a more serious note, um, nines I've often read are known for their fear of loss. And I think for me, my fear of loss comes in the form of loss of relationship with people. And I think that is such a, a particular pain when that loss comes because of the fact that I've merged so much with people that if that relationship is severed, if that tie is severed, I feel like I've lost a part of me. Um, and um, one thing that I've noticed in my life, I'm 30 now, but looking back on like the last 10, 15 years, you know, high school leading up to now, I see so many areas of my life where I merged with people, um, whether that was friends, whether that was um, family, um, my mother's a two. Um, and, you know, I could see why when I first typed as a, as a two, I thought, oh, that makes sense. My mom's a two, I'm a two, but then really starting to take a look back and see, I'm very different in this way. Um, and that's okay. Um, for me, my steps toward growth is it's okay to have a, an opinion. It's okay if something I want to do isn't what somebody else wants to do. It's okay if someone suggests a food place and I say, you know what, I don't really feel like that. Um, and then and, and on a bigger scale, it's okay to go up against somebody else's opinion. You know, there's this, I think for me, that merging just comes from this very big fear of conflict, this very big fear of, I don't want to get someone upset at me. Um, but I'm learning more and more in very small ways, you know, it's okay to have an opinion. And as a lot of people have said already, it's also okay to not have an opinion. Um, there's times where um, my boyfriend's a three and something that I, which is interesting given that we go to three in health to sort of see that dynamic. Um, it's interesting because he kind of knows a little bit about my nineness now. So when it comes to something where he sees me kind of going, I don't know, I'm not so sure. He'll kindly say, do you really want to do this? You can tell me yes or no. And sometimes it's, yes, I really do want to do this. Or actually, no, I don't want to. Or I really don't have an opinion. Um, so, so really for me, the takeaway with that statement, what comes up for me are two things that I'm trying to incorporate in my growth is one, it's really okay to have a different opinion. It's really okay if you don't agree with something or somebody, you know, someone doesn't agree with you. And, and two, it's okay if you don't have an opinion. There are some things we just don't have an opinion about and that's okay too. So that's, the, that's what comes up for me. Thanks, Elizabeth. Right, Laura, you're up. Yeah, I definitely am just like feeling all the love in this room and like these are definitely my people. Um, how I kind of think of merging um, is more toward um, my own goals. So I feel myself if I'm around somebody who has a specific goal or something that they want to do or want to accomplish, like I'm their biggest cheerleader, I will get so much drive and motivation to help them along to reach their goals. But when it comes to something that I feel or express is important to me, which is a hard point to get to anyway to say, oh, wow, I think this is something that I really want to do and this is important to me. I do not have that same drive or that same motivation. I just kind of lack that. And I feel that instead of focusing on my goals and my growth, like I'm waiting for somebody to be like, oh man, this, I'm really excited about this. So I can be like, oh, I'm so excited for you. Let me help you with that. And I can just kind of put my stuff to the wayside and, um, then at that point, I have all this drive to help help them versus addressing what I want to do. And then comes in the self-doubt of, well, did I really want to do that in the first place? Because if I did, then I would have been more motivated to do that. So it's a lot of talking to yourself and, and, and getting to know yourself more and more as you dive deeper into this. But I definitely see myself merging when it comes to um, the goals, not only the goals of my loved ones, but even in like a work situation, um, helping out as a team versus um, doing things on my own. Whew, this was all so good. <laughs> um, I would say for, from my perspective, the merging has really set me in a very
very good space with regards to my career. I could walk into a boardroom full of partners at a law firm and not feel any intimidation because I knew I didn't have any skin in the game. <laughs> so, and that merging part and the coaching part, so I could connect with different folks and meet them where they at and then bring them along because I got to see the bigger picture in all these instances where I did not have skin in the game right which is why I think we make such good coaches and friends because our friends come to us in hordes when they know when they down they just love being in our space because we hold it for them right um, so the merging thing has really worked to my benefit in my career however where I did have skin in the game when it came to personal relationships, there I felt the ouch, right? And I love what Terry said in terms of um, when you realize there's resistance coming up. I think that's key. Because when you don't care, you don't care. It's like Elizabeth says, I don't have a preference, let's go, <laughs> right? Do you want me to care? Okay, then I'll pick a spot if you want me to pick. But um, when we do have skin in the game and when resistance does come up in a space for me, <clears throat> that's where that um, I, need, I need to withdraw and I need to go sit with it. And I'm like, why is this bugging me? <laughs> and if I can answer that for myself, then I will ascertain the, uh, the importance. Like, is it that important to me? And if I can say, yes, it is, just by going through that process gives me the clarity on how to communicate it back to the person who needs to hear it. Hey, this is a boundary and somehow it got crossed and this is why it's not what you did is how you made me feel. Right. Mm, I love that Ida. So good. I want to jump in. I want to jump in and say something Ida. Um, and then let's do another jump. I am um, another quick fire question, but I just love, um, as I'm sitting here hearing everyone's responses and I'm, I'm looking in the Facebook group and seeing everybody's reactions. And like, I think, um, my heart is kind of like invigorated. I'm kind of like energized by this. And I, 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 I listen to your, everyone hears perspective and I hear myself in it and it makes me want to cry because I'm like, yes, that's how I feel too. And it makes me get excited when you guys say, this is how I, this is how I'm coaching myself through something, you know, Elizabeth, you sharing your ideas about it's okay to feel this, it's okay to feel that, and that your boyfriend's helping you through that. I'm just like, yes. And as we, if there's anyone out there watching this or, or us here as a group, like as we look, as we see the good in each other, like let's like savor that because that good is in us too. And like we can, we can like dig deep and how can I bring something else new out in me like that person is because we all have the goods inside. It's just, you know, finding the strength or the way to, to bring that to the world. So I'm just loving this. Okay, Ida. Thank you. Um, yes, so we're gonna do a quick fire, true or false in the same order. Mark, we did get your note. Thank you, Mark. Mark might be jumping off sooner than uh, we're ready to let him go, but we completely understand. I can do the, the quick fire here as soon as he, and then I'll okay. probably have to step out. Okay, all right, good. I will go then. Okay, here goes. This is a long one, so bear with me, okay? Sit with me. Nines tend to fully understand and continually struggle with the constraints of clock time and innately are wired to function better with rhythms, seasons, cycles, and natural flow, as opposed to clock time. Um, I'm gonna stop there, I'm gonna read it again, because it's a long one. Nines tend to fully understand and continually struggles with the constraints of clock time and are innately wired to function more with rhythms, seasons, cycles, and natural flow of the situation. True or false? Helen, go. Oh God, so true, so incredibly true. One of the, when I was about 16, I got really excited. I found a quote in the magazine and I cut it out and I kept it. And it said, the trouble about being punctual is that there's no one there to appreciate it. 
<laughs> um, but no, in general, for me, I think through my artistry and, and teaching also, is that time, I, I just live in timeless time. And, um, you know, the creative process, it really is timeless. And um, when I first met the education that I then went to teach in and train te teachers in was Steiner Waldorf Education. And um, there the whole thing is built on seasons and months and cycles and numbers. And, and I was just so completely at home. I just don't believe in this clock time thing at all because it doesn't mean I finished because a time came on the clock, you know um yeah no that's so true i i love it because we are actually on the clock today all yes for, <laughs> all four of us. so and this is hard for us to manage me and lindsay i know because we just want to keep going all right man you're up i find this to be very true on so many different levels and bigger and smaller um levels of life right i mean the cycle of the day and how everything flows is very non clock time. <laughs> um, I find even in grander schemes of life, I've had seasons of life and I can look back and see the actual seasons of life. So I find that even in my own, you know, um, hobbies, I have seasons of different hobbies that I'll come back to re re repetitively, but put down for a period of time and come back to again. And um, some people think I'm crazy because I go through these cycles of excitement and then I'm just like, yeah, but it's done right now. It's just, yes, True. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Gwen. Yes, true. Um, it drives my husband crazy because I cycle through all kinds of activities and hobbies and I'll pick something like I'm learning to play the guitar right now. And, you know, truly I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, I too had five majors in college. Um, I love routine. I can work within the constraints of clock time. Don't like it, and but I thrive on routine. I love our summer routine. I love getting back into school and then the liturgical year. We're Presbyterian, so we have a very set liturgical year with Advent and Christmas and then whatnot. And I just, I really love routine. But as far as clock time, not so much. I might get I might get there on time and I might not I, you know it depends on what else I'm doing that day I'm gonna jump in here and, and, and just make mention of it speaks to uh, why the nine needs something to keep it going so energy in motion right and if we don't have that something that keeps us in that motion we tend to then uh, as the book says, you know, nine start off slowly and then taper off <laughs> unless they have that rhythm or cycle or process that they attach to. All right, Mark, I think you are next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, absolutely, I, <laughs> um, one of my weaknesses I, I find is I do tend to procrastinate quite a bit. And so there'll be certain deadlines and I, I'll just be like, no, I, I think it can wait a little bit longer. If, you know, <laughs> everyone else will be like, Okay, well, let's get this done soon. Let's get this done right now. I'm like, yeah, let's let's just let's just sit on this for a bit, and, then, and it infuriates the, the people around me. Uh, and then, yes, I, I would say that in terms of like cycles or just natural time, yeah, my my interests tend to to come and go. And during the summer, there I have certain interests, and during the winter, it's other ones. And I tend to curl up more with my books or other hobbies. And yeah, so it, it fits very well. Love that, love that, Terry. Yeah, so I, you know, that's it, it, that's definitely a thing. Um, I've been struggling with trying to find, like, dealing with clock time, like trying to find a planner that works for me in every single different situations. Because sometimes I look at clock time, like, okay, we need to be here at at uh, what two forty five or whatever it was, and so. At about 2.15, I'm like thinking, okay, I'm now looking at the clock and I'm struggling. Like, do I go ahead and go on there because of that clock time? It's driving me crazy. But when things are cyclic, I know that, the, I know that these things are going to happen in a process or in some sort of rhythm. That is a lot more comforting. My body is nice and relaxed. I can deal with those things. Yeah, from a place of strength, it sounds like, rather than placing that clock according to others, right? I love that. Yeah. Love that. Uh, I, okay, Susie? Yes, I would agree. Um, 
I don't run well on time. I don't, I usually put things off and then I'm late because I'm like doing the unimportant things, which I know is a very nine thing. However, I do like someone else said, like routine and I like traditions to the point where that can sometimes get annoying to people. Um, but I feel very safe in my routine and I want it to be the way it has always been. Um, and that is really comforting for me. Love it. Who's next, JJ? Um, yes, so <laughs> I see it in many different areas of my life where the clock and my routine life struggle with each other. Um, I'm a nurse, I work in an inpatient facility and we have, when we have admissions, we have a new patient come in, we have a certain amount of time, you know, it's reasonable us to get to know our patient I, I could sit there all night and talk to the patient and be like so what's been really going on let's get really deep into it but that's not my role at that point and so I want to sit there and talk and I can't um I find myself needing a routine when I'm at work in order to function yeah. honestly um and when that routine gets thrown off like I have an admission at a time that's like in the middle of me passing meds I'm completely thrown off the rest of the night mm. um with school and stuff, I used to have issues procrastinating till like literally the night before an assignment was due because I think partially it was that self-editing would come in there along with that procrastination time constraint thing. I would like, okay, if I do it early, I'm gonna have to go back and continually edit it until I think it's right. And it'll never be perfect. And I'm always gonna hate it. I may as well just do it at the last second, turn it in and not have to do it. Oh my gosh, you are speaking for all of us because I'm seeing every single face going, uh-huh. Uh -huh. I know that because as you were talking, I was thinking, even if it means moving a house, right, packing up to a yes. I literally will wait until I'm under the gun because I know that I have to. With most things, with deadlines, right? I'm like, oh, now I have to do it because there's no other way, there's no other option. But it gets done. It gets done, right? <laughs> Nicole? I'm the same way. I really struggle with a sleep schedule. Um, I would blame my children, but it was like this long before they existed. Uh, I struggle with bedtime, wake up time. Like I, I don't want to have concrete times because what if I have something else to do would stress me out. So, you know, I over plan for it. Well, if I stay up late doing this, it, it's just, it's chaos. I have two planners, one on my computer and one a paper planner and then uh, it's synced to my phone but my computer planner I lie to myself and I tell myself I have to be there earlier than I actually have to be there so <laughs> yesterday's 2 30 dentist appointment was 2 15 in my phone so that way because if not I'm late I'm late everywhere I go and good for you at least you know your weak points and the important stuff we, we've got to yes. get into those yes. <laughs> all right who's next on our list Elizabeth Uh, 100% true. I, um, you know, I do love routine though. Um, at first when I heard the statement, I thought, okay, am I understanding this? Because I like routine. I like predictability, but that's not the same as going by a clock. Um, so, you know, I have a, a one wing, so I, I call myself like the laziest perfectionist you'll ever meet. Um, because I want, I want like lists can be comforting. Like, you know, reminders, things like that can be comforting for me and helping me feel like I'm on track. But then I put things off or I'm um, habitually late to places that I go to. Um, a lot of that has to do with, you know, prior to having to leave for an event, I get caught up in little things. You know, all of a sudden it's like, oh wait, I have a load of laundry in the dryer I can take out right now. But it's like, no, you can do that later. Keep getting ready. You know, like little things start to pop up. <laughs> I just saw Lindsay's thing. Um, certain things start to pop up and I just get sidetracked. Um, but I do like routine. Um, that, that is comforting to me. Um, I, I am trying to work on my procrastination. Um, I am in college as well. I'm going back for my undergrad and I still find myself putting things off to the last minute, writing papers at the last minute. Um, I like to say I work well under pressure and I do. Yeah, that's but the I, I, I really I work well under pressure. <laughs> you know they say if you they say if you wait to the last minute, it only takes a minute. So um, <laughs> there you go. I'm writing that one down. 
yeah, that's a little nugget for you guys. But um, yes, definitely um, to summarize, uh, clock time is still kind of anxiety inducing for me, but I do work well within routines and, and predictability. That's yeah. very comforting yeah. for me. And that's where I feel it's safe, rhythm, but so true. So right, it's that rhythm of staying with the rhythm. That's what we, with, with, where we mm -hmm. resonate with our flow as opposed to, oh, five o'clock, it's now 1.45, right? I get that totally. Laura, do you want to share with us? Yes, definitely 100% true. Um, I agree with most everyone here. I, I love to have a routine and to stick to that routine. And if it's thrown off, um, it's definitely a stressor for me. But I would say the clock is the biggest source of anxiety for me. <laughs> I am one of those people that is always late. But when I'm late, it just drives my anxiety through the roof. And I hate myself for being late. And I get so anxious and so angry at myself. But there's a quote from the Princess Diaries that is like my life. And it's, it's like, a queen is never late. Everyone else is simply early. So I just tell myself that sometimes and just, <laughs> you know, flip my hair to the side and move forward. But I also love to have a planner. And I love to have a list, but it's full of little arrows moving things to the next day and then to the next day and then to the next day. I love it. I love it. All right, Lindsay, what, what, what does the clock do for you? Oh my gosh. Oh, her, her saying that about the arrows going from one thing to the next, I think I just had a little panic attack because that is my <laughs> life. Um, but I love this question because I, I know this about myself. I know that I struggle with time. I know that I like routine but like just hearing everyone talk about it at once, <clears throat> it kind of is just shining a spotlight on the fact that I really need to focus on this for growth because like you mentioned, like the seasons, I don't know how you worded it, but like the seasons that we go through or the cycles, I just, I mean, this is like one of my biggest issues, the, the use of my time and focusing on the wrong thing and getting overwhelmed by all the things it's been, it's probably been the reason the the biggest reason for my tendency towards laziness because i'm overwhelmed with all the things okay. that i think i have to do and i'm focusing on the wrong task so i don't have anything to say besides just that it's very alarming <laughs> i think for me to hear all these at once i'm like oh gosh okay it's okay i need to, okay. I, I really want to like i really want to like get a hold of this because mm -hmm. i think i can I think knowing that it's a type nine issue so prevalent, you know, among all these, these um, panelists, it's like, okay, there can be something I can do even more intentional to grow in this area. And we will, because th that's one of the workshop classes. We're going to take one of these bullets and go deep and say this time thing, right? How do we yes. with that clock? Okay. So, just keep an eye out on the Facebook group. We will be announcing these pop-ups anyway, but what I want, I want to bring it back to the nine and for me, how I've learned to manage that in my world. So I know that as a nine, that's my resting place. A situation would come up in my space. I do need to kick into the six because that is where energy gets spurred up and sparked up that uneasiness, that resistance, that, the skin in the game, right? So when I get that resistance happening in my reality, I go and do the work. Why is this coming up for me? Oh, it's clock and I'm, I've got so much time and there's a due date and I've got to do all of this. So all those things, allow it to come up and let it be. Because when it comes to consciousness, you can go, ah, it's like writing it down. It's that to-do list that makes us feel better. Now I won't forget it, okay? So go there, but don't stay there. Because that's the bouncing off place to the three and then you might bounce to the eight where somebody made you mad and you how vested are you really in the situation so you bounce to the eight and you go now look here right or you'll bounce to the one and be that perfectionist because you vested you're going to do it just like this like a rock star so understand that you are going to go from nine bounce to your your three or your six or your eight or your one that's why those numbers are important. And if you plot them as a nine, it actually makes a five-pointed star. And if you get familiar with that star, you go, ah, I see what's happening right here. I'm in my six. Be in my six for a minute. That just tells me I need to take the time out to reassess. Oh, there I go. I'm in my three. Oh, gosh, I love this. I'm doing my thing now, right? So all of those things are important. None of them is just a downright negative. 
you got to own it and understand it, embrace it, and then embody it. So I'll leave you guys with that. Where are we on time, Miss Lindsay? Oh, we've got okay. 15 minutes. Yep. We're going to, we'll need time to do our drawing and, okay. and close us out. Um, but maybe like one more quick, yeah. quick fire. What do you yes. think? Uh, what do you guys think? What do you want to do with our 10 minutes? Quick fire? Or do we want to We're think? Closing, like a closing thought that they have? <laughs> one of my last quick fires was nines are cat people. True or false? <laughs> Let them go. <laughs> well, I'm just in the process of, um, of applying to be a, um, a, a doctor rescue cat. Um, <laughs> so the answer is yes. <laughs> What's up? Mandy. I'm going to go with, I'm just now getting good with cats. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> because I grew up with dogs and they're rambunctious and energetic and they love you all the time and it resembles like... I want people to feel like that with, with me, right? But I get the cat. Like, leave me alone. I'll come to you when I'm ready. Exactly <laughs> <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> I love it. How about you, Gwen? What do you think? Um, as you maybe, maybe you saw, maybe you didn't, but absolutely. I am a cat person. Um, I love, they're so easy to take care of. They come see me when they want attention. I, I feel like that a lot. Um, but then they need time alone. And so, yes, total cat person here. <laughs> and dog person. I love dogs, too. So. But nothing against dogs. Let me clarify. We just naturally get cats because cats get us. That's what I mean by cat people. Terry, what do you think? Yeah, um, I, all animals, cats, dogs, bears, goldfish, lizards, all kinds of good stuff. But, yeah, I can, I can identify with the cat. Um, like what, what Gwen was saying, it's like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll let you know, right? right. And, and I'll let you know too. <laughs> right, right. I love that. All right, who's up next, Susie? Well, I grew up on a farm and we had about 20 outside cats um, and I loved them at the time. Um, and I like to go home and see them. I don't really want one in my house, but I do like cats. Thank you, JJ. Well, we have four cats and <laughs> our guest bathroom is covered in cat pictures and cat everything. <laughs> so I would say that speaks for itself. And I grew up loving cats from just a small child. I had like a, an encyclopedia of the different kinds of cats. I was really crazy. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a crazy cat person. I love it. Um, who's next? Me. Um, I had cats and dogs growing up, and I love cats. We actually have a beagle now, and he is the most opposite of a cat ever. <laughs> and um, I don't like bouncy animals. I like lazy animals, but um, my children and husband love him, so I love him too. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Thank you. That's what nines do. That's what nines do. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth? Well, I'm going to go against the grain here and say false. Um, I, yay! Um, I, I didn't grow up with cats and my mom was very allergic. So we had dogs all of my life. Um, interestingly enough, my boyfriend has two cats and it's the most I've ever been around cats. I love dogs because I'm a very affectionate person and they're very affectionate. They're always happy to see you. And I think it's that your presence is noticed and valuable. They're always happy to see you. Whereas cats are kind of like, Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And as silly as it sounds, when I see my boyfriend and I want to pet one of his cats and he's just not in the mood, I, there's this like sting of rejection. I'm like, come on, you know? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I relate to their personality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because that's very much how I am as a person. It's just, <laughs> I love that affection that animals give and dogs are so ready and willing to give that affection. Mm -hmm. So while I, I identify with the cat's personality, I love the affection that dogs have to give. So I'm going to say I'm more of a dog person. I love that. Laura. I am with Elizabeth. I am a total dog person. I didn't have cats. My dad was very anti-cat growing up. So we were kind of raised to be dog people. And I am obsessed with my dogs. Um, we do have two cats uh, outside. And they're, they're very sweet. And they're growing on me. But yeah, I'm actually a dog person. All right. Now we know. Lindsay, get a dog. No, that was not the question. Oh That's my gosh. I love this question. Okay. First of all, I just got my first cat. <clears throat> well, uh -oh. we've just gotten our second cat. We've had our other one, Kyle, for a year. 
little Aria, little precious Aria. We've had her for like a couple of weeks. And just hearing this conversation, I'm like, yes, I am a cat because little Aria will pee on the floor if I don't move her litter box gently a little bit every day. I want to get it over there. I want the, the litter box to be over there in that corner, but she's been used to it being right here. You know, we like our routines. We like to know. So I got to gently move it there every day. Otherwise she's going to pee in that. She's going to pee wherever she wants. Right. So little analogy about how like my anger can just come out if I don't have what I want or, you know, the routines that I need. But um, also I've been watching a lot of YouTube cat videos to learn how to, uh, how to like just gently, you know, let her know that I'm a caring person. And if there's anybody out there that's not a nine, maybe your, your spouse or your boyfriend and girlfriend's a nine, you're watching this with them, like be gentle, please. Like <laughs> treat us gently. Let us know that you care and we won't bite you. Not okay? too much. <laughs> Not, too much. <laughs> Not too quickly. Don't move. Don't make any sudden moves. Right. No. Okay. No. Like cats. We will jump and then that's it. And I thought absolutely with I I've never been an animal person ever. Like no too much work. I'm all about my space and but I I ended up being a cat person for the last two years because my daughter's cat needed to move in with me when she moved in with her dad. And so I was this pet owner for two years and I treated my cat like a cat would treat anyone else. Like I would not give it the attention if I was not in that space and I would stay on my rhythm of when it's treat time and when it's whatever, right? Outside time. Today, two years in with this cat, I can tell you it, I, <laughs> it's astounding that this cat will never be more than five feet away from me. Anywhere. I can't go to the bathroom without it scratching at the door. <laughs> Okay, so let the, there's, there's a lesson in there somewhere. That's all I'm saying. <clears throat> so anyway, this was an amazing conversation. Uh, thank you all so very much. We're going to do a quick, quick 30 second checkout for everybody. And then we're going to hand it over to Lindsay for final announcements and final remarks. Um, let's go, Helen. Thank you. It's been really, really wonderful. It's just such, such I, mean, I don't know too many nines actually in life other than online. So That's to be in the, hiding out. <laughs> so to be in the presence of so many, I'm somebody that really, really values similarity. You know, I don't look for differences. It's just like, oh, you too. You know, that's that's what excites me. Similarity. So this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Mandy, 30 seconds. I'm really thankful that you guys invited me to be a part of this. I um I think it's I'm much like Helen. I don't have a lot of nines in my life other than online. So it's really nice to hear actual voices repeating my own words. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Mandy. Gwen. Thank you so much. I feel like I found some kindred spirits and I feel seen and I feel heard. And that is really precious for this nine. So thank you very much. Absolutely. JJ. Oh, did I skip someone? Sorry, my bad. Susie. Terry. I don't know. Someone. Terry. I, it's me. That's okay. That, hey, I'm a nine. That's no sweat whatsoever. <laughs> oh, we good with that. Because it's been awesome. This is a great community and, and just being able to kind of be our nine self to be, well, yeah, there are people that are like me, and that is okay, right? I don't have to worry about things as much. Are we all going to merge? I don't know. More nine, so we'll see. <laughs> I love that. All right, who's next? Please just jump on in. This has just been great. Um, I have to say one of the best things that I did, because I didn't know many nines, was I met a nine on a Facebook site, and she and I have been communicating um, for about a year. And that has been the best therapy for, I, I think, her and myself. Our husbands are the same number, so we've been able to chat about different situations that have come up. And it has been so life-giving and so wonderful to not feel alone or wrong or that there's something not right with us because there's so much wonderful with us nine. So it's been really great. Thank you so much, Susie. JJ, I think. Yeah, sorry, I had a problem unmuting. Um, no, it's, I was uh, a little nervous about saying, guess that I would be on here, because 
I don't, I don't like to hear myself. I don't like to talk out loud, <laughs> um, as much as I used to, um, I think I've become more quiet, but it's, it's really nice to be able to talk to all of you and hear the things that you're saying that maybe I'm thinking, but don't know quite how to put it into words. And so it's, it's beautiful to see this community kind of growing and participating with things with each other. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I'm glad to be part of this because I spend so much time helping teenagers learn to speak that I tend to neglect developing my own uh, expressions of how I feel or when I'm angry, whatever. So I'm glad to hear other adults and not just teenagers say, yeah, I feel that too. This is how we handle it. And it, I don't feel alone. So thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, yeah, this has been great. I, like so many of you have said already, it's nice to be amongst a community of people where you don't feel like you're the odd one out. Um, and I was thinking earlier as we were all going through our different responses, one of my biggest insecurities whenever I am in sort of a panel discussion type setting in any context is this fear like no one really cares what I'm about to say. Like everyone's just waiting for their chance to speak but not in this setting. I feel like we all genuinely want to hear what each of us have to say, because I think we're looking to, to see those similarities, Helen, like, oh yeah, me too. That's just how I'm like, it's not just me. So this is a space where we are all genuinely interested in what the other person has to say. And that's a really great feeling. So um, I'm very thankful for this community and for being able to meet some more nine. So thank you, Ida. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Elizabeth, for being here. Laura? I just love like one of the characteristics of the nine is just being inclusive and so to be in a room full of everyone who is so inclusive and so um, open to hear and then of course to hear all those light bulbs going off in my own head like oh my gosh that's me that's me that's me it's just such a comfort to know I'm not alone out here so thank you so much for including me. Gosh no thank you God, this is so amazing. Um, again I'm going to remind everyone of how I I see nines and that is gosh man we are so powerful in terms of our natural gifts as nines and when reading the Enneagram and the descriptions and everybody else's take on a nine who is not a nine <laughs> I feel like nines need to step up and say hey we a little bit more than just the definition you guys have got going on and what you are describing as a negative in fact is just something that um, the one one side of the coin it's got a flip side that makes me like the bomb that's one of my strengths right and so that's why this this community of nines need to keep showing up for each other just to remind each other that yes, we are phenomenal friends. We are phenomenal coaches. We are folks who can embrace and hold space and incorporate and collaborate. And I want you guys to come back because we're gonna have more conversations like this. Keep an eye out on the Facebook page that Lindsay will share. Um, but yeah, we're gonna keep doing this. So come back, okay? Thank you all deeply. I'm going to do a quick drawing, okay, um, Ida? Um, I'm just doing a drawing for those of your faces that I see right now, plus Mark that had to jump off. And then those live in the Facebook group, I'll go back in and do one because there's like over 50, 60 comments and I, I'm, that's overwhelming. Okay, so for you guys on the group, you'll win a book if I pull your name out. Okay, this is for Nicole, Nicole White. Yay. I never okay. win anything. I know. So <laughs> I'm assuming you already have the road back to you or you've read it. I but have the ebook, but I would love the book okay. in my office if you have Awesome. One. I'm going to reach out to you yes. through Messenger and we'll talk Yay. about that. Yay. Thank you. Yes. Congrats. Okay. So to close this out, guys, I, um, I have so many things. I'm just going to say one thing. Um, this community was started to um, Enneagram Nine Stories and the Peacemakers podcast was started to empower us to bring our voices together and to um, just find out who we are more and more through knowing each other. And so it's all about, um, it's not, the, this community is not about tying a bow on the end of things just to say the nice thing and just to like, you know, be the nice person in the room, but to like really bring out the, the beauty that's within us and the power that's within us and kind of like feel energized by each other. And I love Gwen, 
was it Gwen or Susie? Susie, you said you have a friend that you guys like are both nines and you're both married to the same number. And I just love that the community that we can get from each other because I, I have merged so often with other numbers in my life usually the threes, the sevens, and the eights that I just desperately want to be like. I want to like have their energy, but that, and, and I love three sevens and eights. It's not against them. It's just because they've been in the front my whole life. And I think I'm supposed to be that. Um, I've put a lot of shame on myself. And so um, what I love about this, this group and this, the Enneagram is just that we can, we can just figure ourselves out more. And what can I bring of myself? Because there's that, that essence that's within us. That's like the gold that can just be like, that can come out and it, it it's there. And, and what, I don't, I don't know, I'm not even going to go more because I'll start crying, but thank you for being here. And I'm just so happy. Ida, you're just the greatest. So thanks for being oh, here, no. everyone. And <laughs> hope to see you again online at some point. Yes. Okay? And check out the, the Instagram, in your grind. Enneagram nine stories on Instagram, just to make sure that you guys do not miss out on any upcoming events that we'll have, as well as the Facebook page. And of course, we're going to take this snippet. It was so good. I think we're going to use it for the podcast, but Lindsay will reach out to each one of you just to make sure that you feel cool about sharing the bits of you on here. And uh, we will upload it on the podcast channel. So until next time, peacekeepers, keep the peace and for yourself first. You uh, can un unmute yourself and say goodbye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.